Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. In this episode of Jots and Tittles, I would like to share with you, read with you, a section uh, on the divine providential preservation of Scripture taken from John Owen's work that is titled The Reason of Faith or The Grounds Whereon the Scripture is Believed to Be the Word of God with Faith Divine and Supernatural. Uh, This work was written in 1677, and it appears in John Owen's collected works that are reprinted by the Banner of Truth. It's in volume four, and it can be found there on pages five through 115. This is a part of Owen's larger study of the Holy Spirit, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. I thought it might be helpful to share this section on the providential preservation of Scripture, given some of the misunderstandings and even outright misrepresentations of the movement that I'm part of that's called confessional bibliology that have recently been appearing online. Owen's overall thesis in this work, The Reason of Faith, is that the believer must come to receive Scripture as the Word of God based on an internal compulsion founded upon the fact that Scripture is divine revelation, rather than upon what he calls moral persuasion or moral assurance based on so-called external arguments. And so uh, he writes on page 49 uh, in The Reason of Faith, uh, again, Collected Works, Volume 4, He writes, the sum is we are obliged in a way of duty to believe the scriptures to be divine revelation when they are ministerially or providentially proposed unto us. The ground whereupon we are to receive them is the authority and veracity of God speaking in them. We believe them because they are the word of God. That's the end of the quote. And then on the same page, he adds, quote, Wherefore, we do not nor ought only to believe the scripture as highly probable or with moral persuasion and assurance built upon arguments absolutely fallible and human. If we believe not with faith divine and supernatural, we believe not at all, end quote. Nevertheless, Owen holds that there is a place for what he calls external arguments, reasonably to confirm belief in Scripture as the Word of God. In chapter 3 of this booklet or book, The Reason of Faith, Owen outlines five such uh, arguments that he calls sundry convincing external arguments for divine revelation. And this chapter 3 is found on pages 20 through 47. The five sundry convincing external arguments are, one, the antiquity of the writings, two, the providential preservation of the scriptures, three, the overall divine wisdom and authority of the scriptures, four, the testimony of the scriptures, five, the doctrines derived from the scriptures. So what I want to do is read Just the little section here on Owen's discussion of the preservation of Scripture as one of these five external arguments for faith or belief in Scripture as the Word of God. And this is found on pages 23 through 26. So I'm just going to read that section now. Owen uh, writes, It is apparent that God, in all ages, hath had a great regard unto it, and acted his power and care in its preservation. Were not the Bible what it pretends to be, there had been nothing more suitable to the nature of God and more becoming divine providence than long since to have blotted it out of the world. For to suffer a book to be in the world from the beginning of times, falsely pretending his name and authority, seducing so great a portion of mankind, into a pernicious and ruinous apostasy from him, as it must do and doth if it be not of a divine original, and exposing inconceivable multitudes of the best, wisest, and soberest among them unto all sorts of bloody miseries which they have undergone in the behalf of it, 
seems not consonant unto that infinite goodness, wisdom, and care wherewith this world is governed from above. But, on the contrary, whereas the malicious craft of Satan and the prevalent power and rage of mankind have combined and been set at work to the ruin and utter suppression of this book, proceeding sometimes so far as that there was no appearing way for its escape, yet through the watchful care and providence of God, sometimes putting itself forth in miraculous instances, it hath been preserved unto this day, and shall be so to the consummation of all things. The event of that which was spoken by our Savior, Matthew 5.18, doth invincibly prove the divine approbation of this book, as that doth its divine original. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. God's perpetual care over the scripture for so many ages that not a letter of it should be utterly lost. Nothing that hath the least tendency towards its end should perish is evidence sufficient of his regard unto it. Especially would it be so if we should consider with what remarkable judgments and severe reflections of vengeance on its opposers this care hath been managed, instances whereof might easily be multiplied. And if any will not ascribe this preservation of the books of the Bible, not only in their being, but in their purity and integrity, free from the least just suspicion of corruption or the intermixture of anything human or hetero heterogeneous uh, unto the care of God, it is a incumbent on him to assign some other cause proportionate to such an effect, whilst it was the interest of heaven and the endeavor of earth and hell to have it corrupted and destroyed. For my part, I cannot but judge that he that seeth not an hand of divine providence stretched out in the preservation of this book and all that is in it, its words and syllables for thousands of years through all the overthrows and deluges of calamities that have befallen the world with the weakness of the means whereby it hath been preserved and the interests in some ages of all those in whose power it was to have it corrupted, as it was of the apostate churches of the Jews and Christians, with the open opposition that hath been made unto it, doth not believe there is any such thing as divine providence at all. It was first written in the very infancy of the Babylonian Empire, with which it afterwards contemporized about 900 years. By this monarchy, that people, which alone had these oracles of God committed to them, were oppressed, destroyed, and carried into captivity. But this book was then preserved amongst them while they were absolutely under the power of their enemies, although it condemned them and all their gods and religious worship, wherewith we know how horribly mankind is enraged. Satan had enthroned himself as the object of their worship, and the author of all ways of divine veneration amongst them. These they adhered unto as their principal interest, as all people do unto that they esteemed their religion. In the whole world there was nothing that judge, condemned, opposed him or them, but this book only, which was now absolutely in their power. If that by any means could have been destroyed, then when it was in the hands of but a few, and those for the most part flagitious in their lives, hating the things contained in it, and wholly under the power of their adversaries, the interest of Satan and the whole world in idolatry had been secured. But through the mere provision of divine care, it outlived that monarchy and saw the ruin of its greatest adversaries, 
So it did also during the continuance of the Persian monarchy, which succeeded, whilst the people was still under the power of idolaters, against whom this was the only testimony in the world. By some branches of the Grecian monarchy, a most fierce and diligent attempt was made to have utterly destroyed it, but still it was snatched by divine power out of the furnace, not one hair of it being singed or the least detriment brought unto its perfection. The Romans destroyed both the people and the place designed until then for its preservation, carrying the ancient copy of the law in triumph to Rome on the conquest of Jerusalem. And whilst all absolute power and dominion in the whole world where this book was known or heard of was in their hands, they exercised a rage against it for sundry ages with the same success that former enemies had. From the very first, all the endeavors of mankind that professed an open enmity against it have been utterly frustrated. And whereas also those unto whom it was outwardly committed as the Jews first and the anti-Christian church of apostatized Christians afterwards, not only fell into opinions and practices absolutely inconsistent with it, but also built all their present and future interests on those opinions and practices. Yet none of them durst ever attempt the corrupting of one line in it, but were forced to attempt their own security by a pretense of additional traditions and keeping the book itself as much as they durst out of the hands and knowledge of all not engaged in the same interest with themselves. Whence could all this proceed but from the watchful care and power of divine providence? And it is brutish folly not to believe that what God doth so protect did originally proceed from himself, seeing it pleads and pretends so to do. For every wise man will take more care of a stranger than a bastard falsely imposed on him unto his dishonor. And here ends the reading from uh, Owen's discussion of providential preservation in his book, The Reason of Faith. The Reformed Doctrine of the providential preservation of scripture, it seems to me, is one of the most neglected themes in contemporary theology. I think Owen's views add insight into what the framers of the early Protestant confessions, like the Westminster Confession of Faith, especially in chapter 1 of paragraph 8, meant when they spoke of God's word having been kept pure in all ages. In recent years, there have been various attempts by evangelicals and even some uh, Reformed men to reject this doctrine. You can see the evangelical Daniel Wallace, for example, has suggested that the doctrine, the Westminster Doctrine of Providential Preservation should be rejected, or there have been efforts to reinterpret it. And you can see here the recent writings of Richard Brash attempting to reinterpret uh, what the confession means by uh, the scriptures being kept pure in all ages. Confessional bibliology represents not an attempt to reject this historic doctrine or to reinterpret it, but to retrieve it. Confessional bibliology is an effort to retrieve the classic Protestant doctrine of providential preservation. Sadly, misunderstandings of this position and lack of familiarity with its historic roots have resulted in part in the unjust confusion and conflation of confessional bibliology with IFB King James Version onlyism, a phenomenon of the 20th century. Most recently, a popular Presbyterian YouTuber has rather ungraciously mocked confessional bibliology as KJVO because of questions raised by us about missing verses in the modern critical text and in modern translations, accusing us of promoting wacky conspiracy theories. 
He also suggested that the historic Christian position is to accept uncertainty about what exactly the text of Scripture is, so that we have no reason for anxiety when modern editors and translators either remove or add passages to or from the traditional text. I think you can clearly see or hear in the excerpt that I read from Owen, however, that he believed in the meticulous care of God's word. As he puts it, quote, that not a letter of it should be utterly lost, end quote. He expresses his trust in divine providence to preserve, quote, this book and all that is in it, its words and its syllables, end quote. He even speaks clearly of the scriptures having been preserved despite Satan's efforts to corrupt it. I hope that you uh, heard his statement that was made on page 24, but on the contrary, whereas the malicious craft of Satan and the prevalent power and rage of mankind have combined and been set at work to the ruin and utter suppression of this book. Uh, he says, yet they, the craft of Satan has not prevailed against the preservation of this book. He even describes how, in God's providence, the scriptures were kept by apostatized Christians or an apostatized church from what he calls, quote, the corrupting of one line in it, end quote. I think we can see that the beef that some, including this popular uh, Reformed YouTuber, have with confessional bibliology is not really a beef with us. We're not promoting IFB, King James Version onlyism. I think his beef is really with John Owen, and it's really with the Reformed Protestant Orthodox. And sadly, I think it's in the end really with chapter 1 and paragraph 8 of the Confession. Well, I hope this reading of Owen uh, will be helpful to clarify this point for those who are sincere and serious and open-minded as they approach this topic. I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode of Jots and Tittles. Till then, take care and God bless.